We are here today to discuss the U.S.-China relationship and the investments that we need to keep our nation secure, competitive, and strong, and maintain our leadership on the world stage. And let me make clear from the outset, when we talk about competing against China and countering Chinese influence, we're talking about competing against its government, not the Chinese people or the millions of Chinese Americans who help make our country great. I'm glad to have Secretaries Austin, Blinken, and Raimondo here to discuss the all-of-government approach we need to meet this challenge. And as this is our first full committee hearing, I do want to thank Vice Chair Collins, as well as our chairs and ranking members, Tester, Coons, Shaheen, Graham, and Moran, for working with us on this topic that I know every one of our members cares about. And I'd like to thank all of my colleagues for their work in the recent weeks to jumpstart our appropriations process and hold more than 30 very substantive hearings on President Biden's budget request and critical issues. We have made important progress, but I hope we can keep things on track and mark up our bills soon. Vice Chair Collins and I had hoped that this Thursday would be our first full committee markup. She and I are working very hard and will update all of our committee members on when we expect to have our first markup in the June work period. This week in the House, they are getting ready to mark up their own appropriations bills. It is my goal, and I know the goal of Senator Collins, to be marking up in a similar time frame. What every member in this room knows, too, is that the Senate must have its voice heard in this process. To that end, this committee has received critical input from nearly all 100 senators to inform our work as we craft our spending bills that meet our nation's needs. We owe it to our colleagues and our communities, and most of all, our constituents, to put forward the shared priorities of this chamber in a slate of bipartisan spending bills. And this hearing offers a valuable opportunity to go in depth on one of those shared priorities making the investments that our nation needs to stay ahead of the Chinese government and other competitors who are doing everything they can to try and overtake America economically, militarily, and on the world stage. As I have said throughout our subcommittee hearings, keeping our country safe and competitive is not just about defense spending. Keeping our country safe means investing in diplomacy and development, to counter political and economic coercion, to promote stability, to stand up to autocrats, to support our allies, and advance our global leadership instead of ceding ground to the governments of China and Russia. Keeping our communities safe means funding to stop deadly fentanyl from crossing our borders and dangerous cyber attacks that can decimate our infrastructure, our schools, our hospitals, and more. And it means funding to make sure our supply chains for drugs, food, baby formula, and more are safe, are stable, and not dependent on the whims of Beijing and others. And when it comes to keeping our competitive edge on the world stage, that means investing in American innovation with funding for R&D, advanced manufacturing like we passed in the Chips and Science Act, clean energy jobs, cutting edge biomedical research, emerging te technologies like AI and more. It means investing in our economy at every level, supporting our farmers and small businesses, maintaining our ports and our railways and other infrastructure that we need for trade, strengthening and expanding our trade partnerships so we can sell American goods across the world, protecting our intellectual property. And of course, we cannot be competitive with the Chinese government if we are not investing in the backbone of our economy our working families. We cannot compete without investing in high quality public schools for our kids. We cannot compete without investing in higher education and workforce programs that help key industries find the workers that they need. And we're stunning the efforts to rebuild American manufacturing and so many other se sectors of our economy if we refuse to tackle the childcare crisis that is keeping parents out of the workforce. And not only are these issues as important as our defense investments, they are connected. Make no mistake, China is pressing forward with an aggressive modernization and expansion of their military capabilities. 
As such, there are certain investments we absolutely must make to strengthen our own defensive and deterrence capabilities. The President's budget requests the largest ever amount of funding for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, and that is critical. We need to ensure the military has the resources it needs to stay ahead of China's military modernization, strengthen logistical preparedness, and expand cyber capabilities and more. However, as the Secretary of Defense has said repeatedly, keeping our nation safe requ requires a whole-of-government approach. After all, our weapons need chips. So making them ourselves and working with like-minded partners to secure our supply chains is a matter of national security. And this is key. We need to make sure we have a regular appropriations process so every department, including DOD, can plan for the year ahead. We cannot settle for CRs that freeze our progress, result in year-over-year -year funding cuts, and seriously impair every single one of our agency's abilities to fulfill their missions and move our country forward. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't govern by CRs, and they don't govern by cuts, and we can't either, which is why it's been so important to me, and I know Senator Collins and many others, to make sure we meet this moment, do our jobs, and get our bipartisan funding bills passed in a timely way. I'm glad to say we have bipartisan agreement on the problem we are here to discuss today, keeping ahead of the Chinese government and our competitors. And based on our past bipartisan efforts, I think we do have a shared understanding that the solution here must be an all-of-government approach. Just a few months ago, we passed an appropriations bill for this fiscal year that showed Congress can take this challenge seriously. Senators Shaheen and Moran worked together to increase funding for the National Science Foundation and fund the Tech Hubs program, building on our bipartisan Chips and Science Act to invest in R&D and innovation and building a strong STEM workforce. Senator Coons and Graham secured additional resources to advance U.S. global leadership by growing our diplomatic footprint, especially in the Indo-Pacific, increasing funding for the Indo-Pacific strategy, and providing funding and flexibility for agencies like State, USAID, and the Development Finance Corporation to address emerging strategic priorities. Senators Murphy and Capito made critical funding increases to improve detection and seizure of narcotics like fentanyl and related illicit contraband, and to dismantle and disrupt transnational criminal organizations. Senators Feinstein and Kennedy worked together to increase funding for the Office of Science and Department at the Department of Energy and fund our national labs so we can develop clean energy solutions and improve advanced manufacturing. Our funding bill and the bipartisan infrastructure law also included critical investments to support infrastructure improvements to ensure our ports can ship goods around the world. I think it's safe to stay to say we showed just a few months ago there is bipartisan support for an across-the-board effort to counter the growing influence of China's Communist Party. But if we want to stay competitive, if we want to stay ahead, we have to stay the course and build on those investments, which is why I find the approach House Republicans have called for dangerous, suggesting massive funding cuts across the government at a pivotal moment. After years of bipartisan consensus for maintaining America's global leadership, that tactic will throw in the towel to our competitors and give the Chinese government our spot as the global superpower of the 21st century. Because let's be clear, House Republicans aren't just proposing one year of cuts to R&D and diplomacy and workforce programs, essentially everything that keeps us competitive. They are demanding spending caps that will tie our hands and lock in even more cuts over the next decade. I worry that what is being proposed leads to a lost decade for America in a moment when we cannot afford it. So let's be clear, China is not debating whether to pay its debts or wreck its economy. China is not debating whether to invest in its future or cut and cap the investments that keep it competitive. And China does not operate on CRs. The more we play with default and punt investments and teeter on the edge of government shutdowns, 
the more we prove China and our competitors are right and helping them show the world that it is their moment to overshadow our leadership and helping them demonstrate their core belief that totalitarianism is stronger than democratic values here at home and around the world. That is why it is so critical for the Senate to make its voice heard on America's future. We have to show that there is a bipartisan vision to strengthen our nation's competitiveness and security by investing in American leadership across the board and a bipartisan will to get it done. That is why I've been focused on in all of our subcommittee hearings. It's what I hope to hear about from our witnesses today, and it's why I want all of us to continue our work and mark, mark up bipartisan spending bills soon. Because the bottom line, we find ourselves today at a real turning point. And this year's government spending bills will determine whether or not we are prepared to compete with China and whether or not we will stay ahead or fall behind. We cannot close our eyes or plug our ears when it comes to th the threat the Chinese government poses. We have got to build on the progress we've made, keep our country safe and competitive, and invest in America's future. And as we decide what investments we do or don't make, the stakes couldn't be higher and they could not be more serious. So I want to thank everyone who's here today, thank our witnesses. We look forward to hearing your testimony today, and I will turn it over to Vice Chair Collins for her opening statement.